The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. After Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go out to the neighboring towns so that I may, I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. I don't know how old I was when I first started praying to God for healing. It could have been for my grandmother or even my dog or probably myself. I have no idea how often I have prayed for healing, for God to heal, to heal to me, to heal those I love, strangers, nations, and all sorts and conditions of creatures and creation. The prayers of the people we say at church are just one of those prayers. I have prayed for healing in a passing thought while standing in the shower after falling to my knees, hiking on a trail, lying in bed. You could say I have prayed for healing here, there, and everywhere, borrowing from my friend, Dr. Seuss. Healing is one of those things we look to God to do for us and to us. And while I don't know how healing happens, I believe it does. And the fact that we keep praying to God to heal leads, lends credibility to my belief. And to today's refrain, which I will say again and again, Jesus heals this I know. And the Bible tells us so. The Gospels are filled with healing stories. We heard one of them this morning from Mark. The who, what, when, where, and how of these healing stories is not particularly privileged. The deaf hear, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and the withered hand is restored. Fevers are reduced, spell, spirits dispelled, and demons disturbed along the way. Jesus heals friends, strangers, men, women, boys, and girls. He heals those with great faith and those with little or no faith. Jesus heals Jews and Gentiles, those who follow his advice and those who do not follow him. Those, some of those who are healed are given names. Some are given IDs like the blind Bartimaeus, Simon's mother-in-law, Jairus' daughter, the bleeding woman, and many more. Many more are the nameless ones among the crowds. And Jesus has many ways of healing. He heals with words alone, with the touch of his hand or the healing balm of his saliva. Jesus heals even when he isn't looking, when a woman touches the fringe of his cloak. 
Jesus heals at all times and in all places, morning, noon, and night. And to the objection of some, he even heals on the Sabbath, on that day of rest. He heals in the synagogue, in the marketplace, from the streets and homes and in villages, cities and farms on one side of the Sea of Galilee and the other. And Jesus isn't a selfish healer either. He shares his healing authority with the disciples who too cast out many demons, anoint with oil, and heal many sick. You could say Jesus is an indiscriminate healer. Jesus heals there, here, there, and everywhere. He heals without restraint, abundantly, with a kind of reckless abandon. And this freedom, this abandon, this abundance found in Jesus' healing is wildly contagious to those whom he heals. When blind Bartimaeus senses that Jesus' healing is imminent, Bartimaeus springs up from where he has been sitting on the roadside. He throws off his cloak, and after being healed, Bartimaeus begins to follow Jesus. Others who are healed by Jesus run around the countryside telling Jesus what has been done for them. It doesn't matter that Jesus tells them to keep quiet about that healing. They can't help themselves. And there are those few. There are few that can't believe they could be healed by Jesus. And Jesus gives those an extra nudge. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Jesus tells those types. In the case of Simon's mother-in-law, she is lifted up by Jesus, who reaches down to her. Relieved from her burning fever, she begins waiting on, serving her family and company that has come to her home. Being healed brings people back into the community. They are no longer isolated from others or from their true selves. For Simon's mother-in-law, this means getting back to her family. Her vocation is about feeding and caring for others in her home. If she were a farmer, she would have gotten back to farming. If a teacher, to teaching. And after healing, she finds herself becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus. So she gets down to the business of caring and serving others. This is her true calling, her true life. These healing stories from the gospel are inspiring. They are meant to be. Having heard about these healings, who wouldn't want to chase after Jesus, to reach out and touch the hem of his clothes, to risk the crowds, the disturbances, even persecution, persecution for the chance of being touched by Jesus. And yet the Gospels don't end that way. They don't end with the walking around Jesus performing miracles of healing here, there, and everywhere. The Gospels give us another kind of healing and healer. And Jesus, we are given the wounded healer, the crucified one, the incarnate one, who has been with us here, there, and everywhere in a world that is filled with pain, suffering, and sin. And from that place, Jesus points us to new life, restored creation, to the beauty and joy of Easter morning. Jesus heals, this I know. Like that sacrament of bread and wine that we are missing, healing is sacramental an outward and visible sign of God's invisible grace, pointing us towards that immortal, invisible, God only wise. How do we partake? How do we come to see and know this healing of Jesus in a world that is so filled, still so filled with pain, suffering and sin? It helps if we come to Jesus, praying to be healed and not to be cured. Healing happens even when cure is not possible. 
How many of us have prayed for cures that didn't happen as we prayed? That's not to say that cure is impossible. It's just not the same thing as being healed. Healing is about wholeness, about mending broken relationships with one another and within ourselves. Healing happens even when cure is impossible. And there is a beauty in healing that a cure cannot give. Unlike a cure with healing, there is little risk of being used as a sword against those who are different, disabled, or those who we think need, quote, fixing. Healing is about opening to see God's way, God's order, God's creation and beauty in our disordered, chaotic world. This is what Jesus is doing in all those healing stories, restoring creation. And sometimes it takes silencing the spirits and disturbing the demons, naming and unmasking those diseases among us. And in the end, as the Bible tells us so, healing brings freedom, abundance, and renewed life. So let us pray for God's healing, God's healing here, there, and everywhere, knowing God has been doing more for us than we can ask or imagine. Amen. Jesus, may I unto you.